morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Hanley. I'm uh, the head of digital communications here at the World Economic Forum, and I'm really, really excited to introduce uh, Molly Crockett, a, an associate professor at the University of Oxford in, uh, in psychology, and Philip Tetlock from the University of Watson and the author of the book Super Forecasters. Uh, and we're here to talk about forecasting failure because uh, we're at the beginning of 2017. Last year, I think, was a, a watershed year for polling and forecasting and seeing into the future. Uh, uh, I'm going to first ask Philip to kind of give us an overview of um, some of the uh, some of the insights that came out of the what's seen as a great forecasting failure, uh, uh, the uh, victory in the US election of President Donald Trump. What did the forecasters get wrong? A useful place to start is by dissecting the concept of forecasting failure. Um, most people, when they make forecasts, even when they say seemingly decisive sounding things like, Trump doesn't have a chance, or there's no way Brexit's going to pass, uh, don't typically mean there's a probability of zero or a probability of one. They typically mean that it's extremely probable or it's extremely improbable. Um, you're, in, in forecasting, you're only wrong, decisively wrong, logically decisively wrong, when you say probability of 1.0 and it fails to happen, or a probability of zero, and it does happen. Um, now, I think there were some people at Davos in January 2016, according to Bloomberg, who came pretty close to saying things like that. Um, so they, 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 they should presumably take somewhat of a credibility hit, um, at, at least on that, on that dimension of forecasting. Uh, the, one of the very best uh, poll aggregators in the US uh, is, of course, Nate Silver and his 538 site. And uh, a couple of days before the election, he was uh, putting a probability of about 70% on uh, uh, Hillary Clinton being the next president of the United States. Uh, so some other poll aggregators, like Sam Wang at Princeton, were up around 99%. Um, they had some pretty good statistics. The aggregators had some pretty good reasons for believing that, that Hillary would indeed win. Hillary did indeed win the popular vote by a, a, a significant margin. Uh, she lost the Electoral College by a significant margin as well. Uh, now, if, if I were to say to you, okay, Nate Silver is putting a 70% probability on, on a Hillary victory. Uh, he was one of the most accurate of the poll aggregators. Uh, there were a few uh, forecasters who put probabilities of a, of a Trump victory uh, close to 50 percent, but there were very few. And the question is, um, how wrong was Nate? Should we count Nate th that as a forecasting failure? When, when Nate Silver said 70 percent a few days before the election, was he wrong? Now, that turns out to be a very difficult question to answer. Nate Silver has been making hundreds if not thousands of political forecasts over the last several years. Uh, and we know that Nate Silver is fairly well calibrated. His system, his, his, his methodology is fairly well calibrated. We also know the prediction markets are fairly well calibrated. And what does that mean? It means when, when they say, when you look at all the times they say something is 70% likely, those things happen about 70% of the time. That means you're well, that means you're well, that means 30% of the time those things don't happen. Uh, in my work with the US intelligence community, in which we study lots of forecasters, the very best forecasters, we call them super forecasters, uh, are wrong a lot. The very best forecast. We live in a world where there's a lot of irreducible uncertainty, and the very best forecasting systems are the, the systems that are virtually perfectly calibrated. Like when they say 70%, things happen 70% of the time. When they say 90%, they happen 90% of the time. Systems that are perfectly well calibrated are going to look, there are going to be conspicuous cases in which they look wrong. And if you throw out a forecaster or a forecasting system every time it's on the wrong side of maybe, you're never going to have a well calibrated forecasting system because it is in the nature of the political world that there is irreducible uncertainty. Now, I, I, I watched Nate Silver trying to explain to one of these comedy show hosts uh, after the election uh, why the 70% probability might not have been wrong and he was mercilessly ridiculed. <laughs> people don't get it. Uh, people don't think that way. Um, 
But so that, 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 is, that is the current state of the art. So if, if Nate Silver wasn't wrong, were there other, for, were there other forecast, forecasters who you can say were wrong? Well, I think the interesting question is how much of a hit should a forecaster or a forecasting system take? How much of a credibility hit should it take? When it says, say, there's a 99% likelihood of something happening, it doesn't happen. Obviously, there's somewhat of a hit they should take. How much of a hit is going to hinge on how extensive a forecasting track record they have? Um, if, if, they ha if, they're, if there's an extremely well-calibrated system, uh, the hit's going to be much smaller. If that's the only forecast you've ever seen them make, you probably aren't likely to ever believe them again. So if I'm looking at the forecast and the forecast says 70% and I go to sleep feeling quite comfortable, uh, is that my emotional, is it my emotional state that's interpreting that, s that, that number? You, you really shouldn't go to sleep feeling quite comfortable. I mean, if you were playing Russian roulette and you had a gun that had 10, <laughs> ten possible uh, places for bullets, and you, you knew that three, in three of those places, <laughs> there was a bullet. <laughs> yeah. Would you feel quite comfortable putting it up to your head and pulling the trigger? Of course not. I mean, a 30% chance is a non-negligible probability that, that, of, a, of a Trump victory. Right. Uh, a lot of commentators said that uh, the shock and awe that was the result of both the Brexit, uh, the, the, the Brexit referendum and Trump's victory was a result of the emotional, well, first of all, the, the driving force of the, the, the victories in those cases and the, inter the shock of the, the losers was down to emotional uh, responses. Is that, would, would you agree with that? The, the commentation over the top of the, the polls. I think the election was so close, the polls were so close, and the possibility of correlated measurement error causing a cascade, a cascade in the battleground states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and Michigan, that both sides thought there was a non-negligible probability of losing. Uh, Trump apparently told his family the night of the election, prepare for a rough night. Um, Paul Ryan apparently told Chuck Schumer, you know, I look forward to working with you as majority leader of the Senate. <laughs> um, he, he, I think both sides had some expect, I, I think the Trump side was probably, the Republicans were more likely to expect to be losing because the data were, were in that direction. Yeah. Uh, I think the Democrats were more bitterly disappointed because they quite rationally had a higher probability of winning. Um, uh, so, uh, but so I, I think things unfolded in, in pretty much the way a psychologist might expect. That's right. <laughs> so, Molly, of course, you're an expert in, uh, in uh, moral decision making. And a lot of the commentary that followed both of those votes was around the emotional drivers of, of the decision makers of the, uh, of the, of the electorate. Uh, was, which bits of that commentary struck you as, as accurate around people uh, shaping their identities and using their vote as a, as, a, as a signaling or a message to their communities? I think what was very clear to me in the aftermath of both Brexit and Trump is, is just how powerful the motive to express one's moral views, to assert one's identity um, is for behavior and, and in many cases outweighs um, what we might call economic self-interest. I think a lot of predictions do focus on economic self-interest because it's easier to measure and it's much more challenging to try and quantify and model moral emotions, moral outrage. Um, but as is becoming very clear, these emotions are in incredibly powerful motivators, um, particularly um, in cases where, f where people may feel that their voices are not being heard and may use their vote as, as an expression of, of those emotions. And what, what are some of the ways that psychologists are trying to uh, help economists, perhaps, or forecasters in integrate some of these ideas into their work? Um, we're doing a lot in, in economics and psychology to try and better get a grip on how to quantify and, and, and build models around these emotions. And, and one way that, that we're, we're doing this is, 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 is taking a view that uh, decisions don't take place in, in a vacuum and they don't take place in, in isolation. They take place within the context of social relationships. And when people are making decisions, they're thinking not just about their own preferences, but the preferences of those around them, their friends, their family, and how their own decisions are going to reflect on 
their values and the, their embeddedness in these social relationships. And, and there's a lot of research going on in this area that I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that will become better at predicting these things in the future. And how, what are some of the ways that those ideas are getting integrated into the science of forecasting or polling? Uh, um, well, I mean, I'd, I'm not quite sure, but, but one thing that seems to me like a perhaps good direction is to recognize that particularly around issues that are contentious um, or controversial, um, we should consider the nature of the social relationship between uh, a, a polar or a journalist and the person who's being asked to express their view or make a prediction. Um, because people care very much about their social image and their responses are going to reflect not just their true preferences, but also their concern for how they look in front of the journalist or whoever's asking them a question. Right, so there um, was a lot of talk about the hidden Trump voter, the, yeah. the, the, or the, tri the, the hidden lever who wouldn't, um, who wouldn't declare their allegiance because they would signal to the journalist or to the pollster uh, a particular type of political orientation. Right. Did, did we, did, was there some evidence of the hidden Trump voter, Philip? A little bit. Um, it, 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 in the political science uh, polling literature, that's sometimes called the Bradley effect, um, and had to, it, it really pertained to a former candidate, African-American candidate for governor of California, and the, underest the overestimation of his polling support when he lost. Um, and there have been a lot of studies of the Bradley effect attempting to quantify how big a bias that is. It proves to be a pretty elusive and small effect, I think, it's fair to say. Um, and I think the Trump effect, the, 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 I think there, there probably was a small effect, uh, and that would have been quite sufficient to produce the outcome we're talking about today, uh, because a small systematic bias in the polls, um, in the critical battleground states, could easily have produced um, the, elect, uh, the quite decisive electoral vote uh, victory that Trump had, in, despite the fact that he had a popular vote defeat. So, M Molly, are this, uh, can, can you think about some ways that um, pollsters might uh, ask different questions that, that might get to the source of the truth better? Yeah, and this is, this is an issue that we deal with a lot in the study of moral decision making because um, when, we, when we do research in this area, clearly just asking people, you know, how good of a person are you, how moral are you, is, is not going to necessarily yield an accurate response because, as I mentioned earlier, people care about their image and they're, they're motivated to project perhaps a, a, a better view of themselves than, than may be the case. So one potentially fruitful avenue would be instead of asking people what their own preferences are, um, to ask them their perception of the views of those around them in their community. Um, this lets people off the, ho off the hook um, because... So it's a billion vote. Billy will vote for Brian. I would never vote for Brian, but Billy would Exactly. Vote. It lets people off the hook. They don't have to commit to expressing a view that may be controversial, but they can share their knowledge of, of what others around them believe. This will get at preferences in a couple of ways. One, uh, we know that people are more likely to believe in outcomes that they want to see happen. Mm -hmm. um, they're optimistic. So looking at what people's beliefs are can give clues into what their own preferences are. Um, we also know that people project their own beliefs onto others. So if I believe X to be true, I'm more likely to believe that others will also believe X to be true. So I think maybe by asking people not just what their own views are, but what their perceptions of those around them are, um, could help us build better models of, of collective decision making. Uh, Philippa, how is forecasting changing and will, you know, will 2016, what will the impact of 2016 be on the, the science of forecasting? I think there's a slow movement toward greater accountability and greater transparency in forecasting. I, I think people of growing, uh, elites are growing, even, even elites <laughs> are growing somewhat weary of vague verbiage forecasting in which nobody can really figure out what somebody is saying. Um, if I say there's a, a distinct possibility Putin's next move is going to be in Estonia, um, that's a very safe sort of prediction for me to make because uh, if, if Putin moves into Estonia, I can say, ha, ah, told you, distinct possibility. And if he doesn't move into Estonia, I can just shrug and say, I just said it was possible. Um, 
I, I think there's a growing awareness that, that the vague verbiage in which we express most expectations about political events today uh, makes it virtually impossible to assess who is closer to or further away from being accurate. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, and that's a very comfortable position to be in, right? I mean, because it, it keeps you politically safe. Um, but I, I think there is a growing pressure uh, inside um, many organizations in finance, intelligence analysis, and elsewhere uh, to create systems that allow you to keep track records. And it's only if you have a track record that you can make meaningful claims about forecasting failure. I, th I think uh, be because a well-calibrated system that says 70% is going to be wrong 30% of the time, if you focus on those individual cases, you're going to get a really skewed and misleading picture of forecasting. Uh, so you need to create systems like forecasting tournaments for monitoring accuracy over the long term. I think that the World Economic Forum has a collaborative project with an organization I'm affiliated with, Good Judgment Project, um, in which they're, 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 they're launching a forecasting tournament. I think the Arab Strategy Forum, which I think has some connections to WEF, is also doing that. Um, I know the U.S. intelligence community is doing versions of this. So a, a number of organizations are moving in this direction. Uh, I think it's uh, m a more evidence-based approach to forecasting and uh, I think the world will probably, I, I think we'll be better off having greater transparency in, in, in the process. Yeah. I think right now we're sort of groping in the dark and the, 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 the events of 2016 sort of underscore that. Indeed. Uh, and um, we're coming back to this emotional question, there's a lot of talk, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the elites, and then there's uh, uh, the the opposite word to that. Seem these days seems to be the anger of those who are not the elite. There was a lot of talk about the anger of uh, the anger of the anger of the electorates last year. Uh, as a psychologist, Molly, what is it that makes people angry and makes populations angry? And how can leaders and decision makers factor those emotions into their into their decision making and actions? One of the biggest drivers of anger is inequality, and the unfortunate reality is that there's tremendous inequality in the world today. Um, I read yesterday that something like the top eight richest people in the world own more than the bottom 50%, a report recently out of Oxfam. And not only is there a tremendous amount of inequality in the world today, but that inequality is so visible because Everyone um, in the U.S. has access to the internet, Instagram, social media. The, the, the massive scale of inequality is, is more evident than, than ever before. And decades of research in psychology have shown that when people um, are confronted with inequality, when they're on the losing end of a bad deal, they will often behave destructively. And they'll do that even if the destruction hurts them as well. So a lot of people would rather burn it all down. Um, they would rather have nothing themselves if, if, if it means they can just eliminate the inequality and, and, and sort of uh, level the playing field so that everyone is on, on a, a, a lower level. Right, so there's inequality. Uh, other kind of other, other, other things that make people angry? angry? Feeling disrespected. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling that their views are not are not taken into account, and um, uh, feeling that uh, those in power are, are contemptuous towards them, uh, feeling ridiculed, and um, I, I think that there there has been a lot of that um, in politics. Yeah. Philip, can you th um, are there are there ways that forecasters can take into account this emotional uh, aspect? Are there are there are there th is there research going into kind of uh, measuring populations' moods uh, and helping decision makers move things forward because of that? I was just thinking about Molly's answer, and I'm wondering whether inequality is the driver of the events of, uh, of Brexit and Trump, um, or is it the culture wars, immigration, things of that sort? Um, and I, if I had to bet on what the biggest driver was, it would be more culture and immigration and symbolic identity issues than economic inequality per se. I mean, keep in mind that um, 
when Trump won, I mean, the macroeconomic models of uh, presidential elections were viewing it as close to a toss-up. It wasn't clear, but, but the economy was, has, you know, relative to what the economy was in 2009, I mean, the Democrats had a pretty good track record of bringing the economy back. Um, the un unemployment was, is pretty low in the United States. It's, it's in this five-ish five range. range. Uh, yeah. Now, the percentage of the workforce that's actually, wor potential workforce that's working is, is, is not, is, is far from an all-time high. Um, but there's but this, there's the definite feeling that, uh, th that, uh, that those in power are reaping the greater, pers uh, greater proportion of rewards and that there's, there, there's that as an underlying theme and as you mentioned, the, the, the culture wars, immigration, uh, certainly some of, uh, some of President-elect Trump's electoral themes were around that, certainly the Brexit vote seemed to uh, seem to turn on that kind of on that kind of emotion. I see these I see these issues as really intertwined. I think that that the culture wars are using inequality as a tool um, to stoke outrage, and uh, the issue of immigration um, also relates, I think, quite strongly to inequality. One of one of the the more uh, revealing accounts that I read after the election was. Uh, a, a young woman who uh, had voted for Trump, and she um, she was very uh, angry because she's working three jobs and and uh, barely getting by, barely able to feed her kids, and 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 she sees uh, immigrants coming in and and receiving government assistance that she's not qualified for because she's just over the over the threshold, and. Again, people are looking around them. They're comparing themselves to others, not just to elites, but those in their immediate in, vicinity. Envy and status, and yeah, and these identity. are these are really primal emotions. Yeah. They they tap into very ancient circuits in our brain. There's there's evidence that uh, concerns about inequality are 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 present to some extent, perhaps in our primate ancestors, and mm -hmm. and and. I just see I see the, the the anger around immigration and the issues and the culture wars as being intimately related from inequal uh, it related to inequality not not the same but but I, I think that they're they're all wrapped yeah, up yeah, together yeah, certainly uh, here in Davos of course uh, mm -hmm. we gather together leaders from all walks of life and they have been branded the elites and been accused of uh, living in a bubble, partly because of uh, the emotional surprise or response to the events of last year. Uh, the one commentator has been widely quoted as saying that the Davos consensus is always wrong. So I guess my question to you is, uh, uh, to, the, to the both of you is, how can you know groups of people, groups of decision makers be more aware of uh, or make themselves more aware of the emotions and the uh, the forces that are driving. Uh, if if the forecasting, if their emotional responses to forecasting, uh, everybody sees what they want to see in the forecasts. How can they avoid those um, avoid those the frames in which they view things? If a forecaster gives me a forecast, how can I uh, apply a, a um, an objective screen to it, rather than a subjective screen. Well, I, get, I would say something to reassure people at Davos that Ken Rogoff, uh, he was joking, obviously, but uh, uh, the, the notion that the Davos man, man is, uh, that you said Sam Huntington phrase, <laughs> the Davos man is always wrong, uh, that's actually not true. Um, it's a very, it's very, very difficult to do worse than chance. <laughs> so, uh, the, whether the Davos man is more accurate than the dart throwing chimpanzee is another question. But always wrong. That's uh, not true. Um, now, um, I say that the best predictor of tomorrow's weather is today's weather. Well, it's, uh, it, that, that that actually experts are extremely hard pressed to beat a simple extrapolation algorithm that predicts continuation of more of the same. That, that's, that's true. The dart-throwing chimpanzee experts can beat a little bit, <laughs> but predicting a simple extrapolation algorithm is extremely difficult. Which is, which, is, which is where you get the surprise around Brexit and Trump because it's not more of the same. 
Predicting change is, 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 is the great challenge, whether it's central bankers or intelligence agencies, that, that is where um, most systems fail. And of course, that's what we're most interested in predicting is change. Yeah. Hence the disappointment in forecasting. Uh, I might just ask you for a last comment there, Molly, on, uh, on, on how decision makers can be uh, more aware, how, can, how they can make themselves more aware, whether it's their, uh, the, their, the employees in their company or the people in their electorate or uh, their friends and family, what are their, how can they make themselves more aware of the emotional state of those constituencies? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think I, I would just finish by, by pointing out that, that we know from research in neuroscience that being in a heightened emotional state, um, being highly aroused, being stressed, um, directly impacts uh, the, the brain systems involved in predicting outcomes and in making decisions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in many cases kind of uh, throws a wrench into things, uh, increases in uncertainty, increases volatility and noise in the system. So um, I guess to the extent that people can cultivate a sense of calm, uh, a sense of maybe be caring and, and socially aware calm, um, the better decisions that they'll make. And Philip, do you see the reputation of pollsters and forecasters uh, reviving over the course of the next year or two? I, I think that the future, I, I will make a bold forecast about forecasting. I think the, the, the trend will be toward increasing transparency and rigor in monitoring forecasting. Uh, and that'll be done through a combination of forecasting tournaments and prediction markets. And once we have a better sense for what the general track records are of forecasters, we'll be less likely to um, misinterpret particular outcomes like Brexit or Trump. Very good. If there are no pressing questions, are there any pressing questions from the floor? Isn't the biggest mistake we're making is uh, that we're unwilling to admit that some things are just not predictable? In other words, we're taking Trump and we're taking Brexit as examples, but these are relatively simple examples because it's one event and you just have to guess yes or no. Uh, but other things like uh, the uh, uh, will a war occur, will peace process uh, succeed and so on, aren't there too many factors so it's really impossible to predict uh, and it's kind of pathetic that we're even thinking that it is possible to predict? Um, well, that Nassim Taleb has taken a, a, a pretty strong position uh, on the futility of forecasting. Uh, I, I would argue that um, you know you can't live with it, you can't live without it. Uh, any, all forms of policy planning assume forecasting. Any, anyone who has a policy preference on anything is making an implicit forecast, an implicit conditional forecast. So you're not going to get away from forecasting. The question is how explicitly are you going to do it and are you going to try to get as much juice out of the system as you can. I think we try to predict things that are three to five to ten years out. It, virtually nobody does appreciably better than chance. Uh, predicting things within a narrower time frame, uh, well-specified outcomes, you can achieve increments in forecasting accuracy. Uh, they're not huge, but they're, they're palpable, and a 10 or 20 percent increment in accuracy matters a lot within a three-month to 18-month range, which is, I think, the sweet spot zone for improving forecasting. Um, a quick one. I read last week, I believe it was, that a French newspaper was going to do away with opinion polls in the run-up to the French election. Do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> uh, very French. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> I think we'll close. Thank you very much, Molly Crocker.